Hi, I'm Shadaj. I'm a PhD student at UC Berkeley, where I work on the Hydro Project, where we're building a better way to write distributed system software. Traditionally, when writing distributed uh, applications, we write them as isolated binaries communicating over a network. We might write our single node application logic in a language like Rust and use RPCs co to communicate with other processes forming a distributed system. But the issue with this is because our uh, programs are written as single node binaries, the network is an unmonitored part of our application. Each Rust binary operates in isolation, and the network is, uh, is considered an external behavior of the system. But the network is actually where most of the issues in distributed systems come from. Issues like message delays, retries, failures of message delivery, and serialization bugs can cause all sorts of trouble. And yet the programming languages we're using today don't reason about these in any way. The goal of the Hydro project is to fix this by creating a global programming language where you write your distributed systems all together with, so that the compiler can reason about correctness. In Hydro, you write distributed systems programs by stringing together regular pieces of code with send operators, which allow you to uh, introduce the network into your program without having to split your application in across several files or into several binaries. Hydro programs are actually standard Rust programmers, programs, but what is exciting is the compiler. When you add these send operations that move data across the network, we automatically slice up your program into components relevant to each location in your system. And these get compiled down to individual Rust binaries. So you get the performance of traditional RPCs, but the programming language capabilities of a global distributed systems language. Now, Hydra is focused very much on correctness of distributed systems without sacrificing performance, in the same way that Rust focuses on memory safety without sacrificing performance. And just how Rust lifetimes get you to think very carefully about how you're um, tracking pointers in your program, Hydro is designed to get developers to think carefully about potential ways that your distributed system might fail. In today's demo, we're going to be computing pi, a classic distributed systems program. Now, the way we're going to estimate pi is by starting out with a unit square, 2 by 2, centered at the origin, and we're going to inscribe a circle in the square. Now, what we're going to do in our computation is randomly sample points within this square and count how many are inside the circle. If we take this percentage and we know the area of the circle and the square, we'll know that this is pi over 4. And so we can estimate pi simply by multiplying this percentage by 4. Now, how are we going to do this in a distributed system? Well, we're going to be computing and aggregating these samples within our square um, on several worker nodes. So on each worker node, we're going to continuously generate mini batches, perform a local aggregation, counting how many fit are, in, are within the circle. And then we're going to send these aggregate results to a leader node. And the leader is going to compute an aggregate across all of these workers. And over time, we'll sample this aggregation to print out estimates of pi. Now, throughout this demo, I'd like you to focus on three key aspects of Hydro. First, we're going to introduce locations, which are how you write distributed system software within a single Rust function with Hydro. This is the send operator that I mentioned earlier. Second, we're going to introduce stream types. I said that Hydro focuses on exposing potential sources of failures in distributed systems. And in this example, we're going to see that in action with types that guide us to make appropriate decisions for dealing with the network. And lastly, we're going to take a look at how Hydro makes it possible to write practical programs. Hydro is designed with a strong type system in mind, but just like Rust, there are certain situations where the programming language can't reason about complex behavior. And just like Rust has unsafe, Hydro too has an unsafe sublanguage that allows you to escape from the safety and write programs that do important things. So let's go ahead and jump into our editor. So I have VS Code open here, and you'll notice this is standard Rust, and I'm using standard Rust tooling, such as Rust Analyzer here. Now let's get started by writing our program. We're going to we start on each worker, where we want to generate these mini batches of samples. Now you'll notice I have two variables here. And in Hydro, different compute locations are exposed just as regular Rust variables. I have the leader, which we're going to be using later, and the workers. You'll notice that these have two different types. The leader is a process, because there's a single machine that's going to be running this leader, where we're going to be aggregating all of our values. But the workers are a cluster, and that's because we're going to be running several instances of the same program. By having two separate types for this, we can introduce concepts like auto-scaling into our program, because we, our cluster is always just going to be several Cindy-like nodes running copies of the same program. So let's program our worker. Now we want to generate batches, and on every batch we want to perform a local aggregation before sending it over the network. In Hydro, if you want to do something like batching, you use a model called ticks, and ticks are a way to introduce time into your program, just like a for loop. So in, on my worker, I'm going to create a tick, and this now I'm in the world within this iterative loop. And on every tick, I'm going to generate a batch, uh, and I'm just going to continuously generate batches of size 1024. Now you're, you notice that I wrapped this 1024 in a Q exclamation mark marker. We'll talk about this in just a sec. But first, let me, for each element in my batch, you'll know, I'm going to generate a random sample inside my square. So how am I going to do that? Let me first store this into a variable. I'm going to call this my samples variable. And let's take a look at the type. So again, this is a regular Rust type. And you'll notice that samples is a stream of unit values. When I'm generating just a batch of, of nothings, it's going to be units. The, the stream is going to be generated on every tick, on every member of this cluster. 
And in fact, our type system even tells us that the stream is bounded, which means it's guaranteed to terminate in finite time because I'm generating it locally on a machine and I'm not involving the network. Now, if I want to generate random points, I'm going to have to do two things. First, I'm going to have to add the random uh, number generator library. You'll notice that I just did cargo add rand, and that's because Hydro fits regular uh, into the regular Rust ecosystem, and you can use whichever Rust libraries you want. Now, let me generate these points. So I'm going to map my, my batch, and for each element, um, I want to generate a random point inside the square. Um, and the way I'm going to do that is I'm just going to call rand random, and it's going to uh, generate tuples of two doubles. And this is going to be within that square centered at the origin. You'll notice that, first of all, my large language model agent that I have installed is very helpful here because this code looks like regular Rust iterator code. And that's one of the key design goals of Hydro is to make it look familiar for those who've programmed in Rust or other similar languages before. Now, the second thing I mentioned, I would I'd talk about this Q exclamation mark later. Now, in Hydro, we're going to be programming, writing programs that span several machines, but we want to be able to compile this program down into separate binaries for each machine, which contains just the logic relevant to that machine. The Q exclamation mark macro is a helper that allows us to isolate the pieces of code that need to be preserved for these runtime binaries. So we're going to compile this code and we're going to effectively serialize these closures so that we can include them in the compiled binaries, in this case, for the workers. But other than that, everything is normal. I get code completion, I get syntax highlighting within this. So it's regular Rust other, other than this wrapper. Now, my samples now are, are a couple of doubles. And so next I want to count how many of these, how many points I have total and how many are within the circle. I'm going to be doing that using a fold, which is a standard functional programming way to perform an aggregation. In Hydra, when you write a fold, you first provide an initial value. In this case, I'm just going to have a couple of two, two integers, one that's going to count how many are in the circle and one that's going to count how many are in the square in total. And then my combinator is going to have the shape where I'm going to count my total in circle, total in square as one parameter. And then my second parameter is going to be um, my x, y coordinate. Now, my language model is being a little too helpful here. I have to write this code a little bit differently. So if my point is within circle, which we can use by computing its distance from the origin, I'm going to increment how many my circle counter and increment my square counter. Otherwise, I'm just going to increment my square counter. And that's my aggregation. Uh, let me close off my parentheses. Now, you'll notice that the type of samples is now a singleton, and this is because a fold produces a single value. Now, we're going to be producing this single value on every iteration of this, this iterative tick that's executing on every worker node. Well, what I want to do is stream all of the aggregations across all the ticks to my leader. And so if I want to get all the values across the ticks, I just call this API method called all ticks. And now this converts from a singleton inside every tick into a stream across all ticks. And I have a stream of I32, I32. And you'll notice now that the type says that it's unbounded, right? Because I'm going to be having an infinite loop that's generating these local aggregations. So those are my samples on my worker. Now let's start writing kind of distributed code and send these values to my leader. So what I want to do is take all these samples and pool them all at my leader node. Well, to do that, it's actually very uh, simple. I take my samples and I send using bin code to the leader and I just pass in the leader as a parameter. Now let's take a look at the return type. So I'm going to uh, call this all samples. What is the type here? Now, there's a lot going on here, so I'm going to walk through it step by step. First of all, I'd like you to notice that streams keep track of where they're located, and this helps you prevent bugs like trying to use data that's located on different machines. So the stream on the leader process, so we, we keep track of that. The second thing is it's unbounded, because again, I'm generating infinite uh, values on each of the cluster workers, and so if, if I send them over the network, I'm going to have infinite data. Now, what is the type of elements in the stream? Well, I have several cluster members that are all sending uh, data to a single leader. And so actually, I'm going to receive a tuple. So each tuple is going to uh, contain the ID of which member of the workers cluster sent this message um, and a tuple of the, uh, the counts that I sent from that worker. Now, you'll notice, in fact, this cluster ID is actually type safe. We keep track that this is a cluster ID for a worker. And this is really important when building more complex distributed systems because it helps avoid confusing IDs for, for different clusters. All right, so now I have all my samples and I want to now aggregate them into a global aggregate of the counts across all my workers. The way I'm gonna do that is take all my samples and I'm gonna reduce. Um, reduce is like fold, except the initial value is just gonna be the first element that I get. Now you'll notice that the code completion did not suggest me to call reduce. It suggested me to call reduce commutative. And this is a key part of how Hydra helps you prevent distributed systems bugs. So let's go back to the type for all samples. It was a regular stream, but we have this extra type parameter at the end that says no order. Hydro, because it knows where a network takes place in your program, can also use a type system to keep track of potential sources of non-determinism introduced by the network. In this case, I have several cluster machines, which are all sending data to a single leader. And the, me the, the messages from these different cluster machines may be non-deterministically delayed, which means I don't have a guarantee that the order of messages on the leader node will be deterministic. 
Therefore, if I want to deterministically perform an aggregation across all these elements, that aggregation needs to be commutative. Otherwise, depending on the network delays, I would end up with wildly different results. In this case, our aggregation is trivially commutative because we're just going to be performing sums. So in this case, uh, I'm just going to be adding a couple elements from each worker tuple. I'm just going to call this worker from worker all. So I'm going to be adding to my counts for all the counts from each worker. Now, I, one more thing from worker here is actually going to contain that cluster ID. I don't want that cluster ID. I don't care which worker sent that. So I'm going to call a variation of this API called send bin code interleave. Send bin code interleave just drops the cluster ID if I don't need it. Now, let me jump to the definition of send bin code interleave to show another point. In Hydroflow, you can actually very easily write your own utilities like this to drop the cluster ID. In fact, in our standard library, it's just implemented as send bin code followed by a map, which drops the cluster ID. And you can write utilities like your own for this and that go as complicated as implementing concepts like quorum, quorums. Now, once I've done this reduce, let me store this in a, va a value, let total aggregation. My total aggregation is an optional because I'm performing a reduce. If I have no data, I won't have any output yet. So that's why it's optional and it's on my leader. Now, the last thing I want to do is I'm continuously updating this optional value according to this aggregation, right? Because I have messages coming in continuously over the network. I want to be able to print out samples of this aggregation because it's continuously changing. So what I'm going to do is take my total aggregation and I'm going to sample every one second. And I'm going to use a standard rust time API. And my code completion actually helped me out by printing the remaining logic I'm going to need to print out my estimate. Now you're going to notice that I have type error here. The compiler is saying this is a call to an unsafe function. This is going to change in the, in the near future, but right now Hydro exposes unsafe distributed systems code using the same unsafe keyword as Rust uses for memory safety. And so if we want to actually call this API, we have to opt into the non-determinism of sampling according to a clock. So I'm going to wrap this in unsafe. Again, in the near future, we're hoping to replace this with a custom keyword or custom API that's like unsafe, but for distributed systems. I'm going to import duration. Now I can get out a, a stream. Now this is going to be a tuple and my code should compile. Again, I'd like to point out something here. I didn't have to use unsafe anywhere else in my code, right? Because I was being careful to perform a commutative aggregation and I was performing a full that would produce deterministic output modulo the randomness of my points. But the moment I did something that might cause potential non-determinism such as sampling, then I have to explicitly opt in. And this is really great when you're writing complex distributed system program programs. For example, in our Paxos implementation, there are exactly 13 instances of the unsafe keyword. And each of them corresponds to a key invariant that the developer does indeed need to think very carefully about when ensuring that their Paxos implementation is correct. And so the hope is Hydro guides you to write to the correct distributed systems program in general. Sometimes you need to get escape hatches, but even those escape hatches are very explicitly annotated and easy to think about carefully in processes like code review. All right, so this is my distributed systems program. Let me run it. Let me briefly show you what running a Hydro program looks like. Now, you'll notice that I have these two parameters again, one for the leader and one for my workers. Well, where do these parameters come from? That's in my deployment script. So in Hydro, you write deployment scripts also in Rust, but what's interesting is you take these variables for your leader and worker that you passed in, and before you actually launch the program, you have to map them to a deployment target. So in this case, I'm gonna be running the process on localhost and my cluster on four instances on localhost, so I'll have four copies. But we can go beyond localhost and we actually support several common cloud providers as type safe deployment targets in Hydro. All right, let me run this program. So I'm gonna run this high example. Again, I'm using the regular Rust toolchain for this. It's gonna compile. Now it's actually gonna be generating several Rust binaries under the hood. Again, one for the leader and one for the workers. And so here we're actually compiling those binaries into, into production pieces that we can actually launch. And now we're generating estimates of pi. So that's Hydro in, in a couple of minutes. Now, this is a simple toy example of, of computing pi, but what we've shown is that this programming approach actually scales to much more complex distributed programs. We've implemented things like Paxos, two-phase commit, we're building things like key value stores. And in fact, some of these things have been written by undergraduate students without that much distributed systems knowledge, but because Hydro exposes distributed systems concepts such as network delay, batching, retries directly in the language, it's actually quite easy to pick up and write correct programs from the beginning. So I hope you'll give Hydro a try. You can check it out at hydro.run. And thanks for watching.